Greetings, weather watchers, and welcome to the newest feature on the Collapse Cafe and Doomsday Diner, Weather Gone Wild. In this series, I am going to look at the various climatic issues we are facing down as the ocean heat content continues its inexorable increase, as the Earth produces more geotectonic energy, and as Homo Sap loads up the atmosphere with more CO2 by burning fossil fuels. The two effects are synergistic. Although, in my humble opinion, the greater factor here is geotectonic energy release, rather than the anthropogenic causation. Either way, though, it really doesn't matter. The overall effect is a rapidly changing climate, which there is a little to nothing we can do to stop it from occurring. So again, in my humble opinion, what we need to do now, if we expect to survive this period, is to figure out our means and methods to adapt to a changing climate rather than trying to stop the climate from changing. Although certainly, changing our overall behaviors and not exacerbating the problems would be a good idea at the moment. The effect of more energy available in the system, from wherever it is coming, is to make all sorts of weather events more extreme or more frequent. We no longer just have typhoons. Now we have super typhoons. We no longer have droughts. Now we have extreme droughts. We no longer have tornadoes. Now we have tornadoes popping up every other day in places they never popped up before, like Boston, for instance. Boston is a bit removed from Tornado Alley, you know. Nowadays, we don't just have floods. We have 500-year floods that occur every year. <laughs> I got the idea for this series when I was going through the collection of diner contributions to the favorite photo album on the diner and the diner lens our weekly compilation of doom photos from around the net. The number which depicted some climatic disaster occurring somewhere on the planet was extraordinary. So I started categorizing them by type and by location. Mega snow events, droughts here, there, and everywhere, lovely sat photos of huge cyclonic storms, etc. Any given type of event has dozens or hundreds of photos floating around the World Wide Web, and they are sobering pictures indeed most of them. Just making a decent selection on any single disaster is tough because of information overload. When you start to look at all of them in aggregate, it becomes overwhelming. Anybody who denies climate change is well underway here, has the head buried so far down in the sand, they are practically through the crust and sniffing the mantle these days. Initially, on getting the brainstorm that I should produce a series on climate disasters, it was tough to decide which type to focus on first. Hurricanes and typhoons seemed like a good one to start with because they are so big and dramatic. There's also a great history there with big ones like Camille and Katrina and Sandy. No shortage of images to be sure on this one. Another good starting point would have to be drought since that most directly affects food supplies and is a primary driver in the refugee crisis across MENA. There are drought problems in just about every major ag-growing region in the world. It's not strictly a Californicators problem. In the end, though, the first choice was answered for me by breaking news on the climate disaster front, the floods hitting the United Kingdom in Scotland and Wales. Many of the pics you see in the slideshow come from this latest event, although by no means are the only ones I included. Jakarta has seen record flooding lately, so has China, and of course the Philippines these days seems to have a new 500-year flood every 500 days or so. <laughs> now, most of the time, even the worst floods don't take out huge number of lives. Not like earthquakes and tsunamis, anyhow. Depending where they hit, though, the property damage can be beyond belief. If a flood hits some small town in the Philippines, nobody gives a rat's ass about that, except, of course, the folks who live in that town. <laughs> the flood gets more attention if it hits Manila, though, or Jakarta, or some other third-world big shitty where a lot of people live. It still fades off the front page of the news pretty damn quick, though. More attention is paid if the flood hits a first-world country, and more still if it hits a major metro in a first-world country. Such is the case with the current round of flooding taking place in the UK as I write this rant. Decent-sized cities like Leeds and Manchester are under several feet of water. These two towns have a huge football rivalry. The riots when these two towns meet for a footy contest are legendary. Only Brazilians riot better at soccer matches. <laughs> 
Do you think they will cancel the footy contest because of the flood? I doubt it. The show must go on. They'll move the matches to London, or even fucking Paris if necessary, and send footy rioters armed with Glocks up against terrorists armed with Kalashnikovs, which might even get as good ratings as the footy match itself. <laughs> I'm backing off from the theater of the absurd, however. What astounds me as I watch the pictures go by are all the floating cars that are clearly fucking totaled in such a disaster. There's even one in there of a half-submerged Rolls-Royce in Jakarta. Now, how many people first off had flood insurance on their cars? And just how often can they keep replacing them when totaled in a flood? While well, most of the McMansions don't wash downstream in all but the biggest floods, just how often can you afford to replace all the rotted sheetrock each time the first floor gets flooded? What about all that furniture, too? So yeah, you get the requisite, I am just grateful to be alive. <laughs> Sound bites from the afflicted right after the event. But two months later, after the waters have receded, do you ever hear from them again? Nope. Their macabre now stinks from mildew. They have no car to get to work, and the 200-year-old pub they used to bartend at is now downstream 30 or 40 miles away in bits and pieces. Are they still so grateful to be alive at this point? Besides, the obvious economic consequences of regular major floods are the health consequences. First off, in any number of the photos in the slideshow, you can see everyone wading through sewage floating crap of all sorts surrounding them. An obvious breeding ground for all sorts of diseases. If the temperatures are the slightest bit warm, it's going to be a breeding ground for mosquitoes, along with all the smaller bugs that wreak havoc on the typical homo sap. Then you have the fact that the entire water supply is compromised. Toilets don't flush, obviously. Most of them are underwater. <laughs> Fresh water isn't coming out of the taps either. Electricity is out in the neighborhood, so sewage treatment plants aren't working either. Even after all the water drains off at some point, it takes a good deal of time and money to get all the system cleaned out and up and operational again. Where is all this money coming from? Basically, two systemically important big shitties, new loans are dished out by the international banking cartel for the rebuilds and fix-ups. Same as FEMA here. They don't give money away. They just offer up new loans. So each time you get a new disaster, your neighbor goes deeper in debt. How many cycles can you go through this before the debt service is more than the whole community earns in a year, even in the good times? What is clear is in that just about all the major big shitties is an increasing likelihood of flooding events as time goes by. Low-lying cities like Miami experience it regularly already every time there is a spring tide. And even worse, when there is a Proxigean spring tide, which occur with decent regularity as well. Even worse than those are extreme Proxigean spring tides, which occur about once every 31 years. Add to any of those a decent size onshore wind, and your low-lying coastal big city is under a few feet of water in no time. You don't do much better in inland big cities either, because all of them are on major rivers. Because you need a large and dependable source of water for a big city. And you need somewhere to dump all the waste, too. Besides that, when these places evolved, navigable waterways provided a means for trade and transportation of goods. It's only since the advent of the railroads and automobile that more large cities evolved in a few other places. Although, even here, the biggest always need the sewage aspect of draining the shit out of the place to somewhere else downstream. So, it is unlikely, too impossible, that the huge population of Homo sap currently walking the earth can move away from these places and go elsewhere. Which means this population is going to be subject to more flooding events and more disease, and at some point, they will become inviolable to fix up again after the latest flood. There's a reason why the flood story of Noah and the Ark made it into the Bible. Persistent flooding is a civilization killer. And that's all the doom. This time until next time at a Weather Gone Wild here on the Doomstead Diner. Later, Doomers.